Hi guys, it's turning out to be a fine morning here in the end times in paradise in uh, Garfield, Texas here on Sunday morning, <coughs> February 25th, 2018, somewhere in there and I have to get out weeding my garden and off to a picking party, imagine that. Before I go, it being Sunday, uh, you guys get two Sunday sermons, and I almost uh, might even make it three. And I'm going to be bringing to you today um, a couple of selections of, of essays from, I don't know whether he'd call himself a doomsday prophet or not, but he is certainly a fine preacher, and that is... Professor Robert Jensen down there, and he's a journalism professor at University of Texas, who I had the pleasure of interviewing yesterday, and I will be putting that interview out Tuesday night, but to whet your appetite, if you are or are not familiar with Robert Jensen, we're going to go over to resilience.org, resilience.org. If you're not familiar with that website, you need to be. And if you go over to resilience.org and look for Robert Jensen, that is the J-E-N-S-E-N -E -E spelling, no relation to Derek, you will find, good Lord, 30 or 40 essays from this man who needs to be a lot more well-known here in the Doomosphere. So uh, you get two sermons. And we're going to start with, it's the sermon is is actually uh, sort of a, a eulogy to a friend of his who died, I believe, in 2012. Uh, but Robert is using this eulogy to his friend to uh, point out a larger picture. And the title of this essay, which was originally published in June of 2014, <clears throat> After the Harvest, Learning to Leave the Planet Gracefully. And I'm going to put the link to this entire thing. I'm going to have to skip through some of it just for time's sake. Take it away, Robert Jensen. <clears throat> Every time I read the latest bad and getting worse news about the health of the ecosphere, such as last month's report that the melting of some giant glaciers had passed the point of no return, I think back to a conversation 25 years ago that helps me put such news in perspective in a Minneapolis bakery where my new friend Jim Coplin and I had settled into a Friday morning coffee session to analyze the world, Coplin told me that he thought the most important task for human beings as a species, not just as individuals, was, quote, learning to leave the planet gracefully. <clears throat> he said this matter-of-factly, not joking, but also not overly dramatic about it. This was a judgment he felt obligated to share with me once our friendship had, had deepened. Our conversations had gotten sufficiently serious, and he had determined that I could handle it. Talking about, you need to choose your friends that you talk about this shit with very carefully and determine that your new friend is one of the few people on the planet who can handle the truth. Yes. <clears throat> Why would human beings need to learn to leave our planet gracefully? The answer, so painfully obvious today, as the evidence about ecological crises piles up, readily available to anyone who chooses to know, was clear to Copland more than 25 years ago. Although he wasn't prone to quoting scripture, I am, so let me offer a why in the words of Jeremiah from the Hebrew Bible. This is Jeremiah 8.20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not 
saved. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremiah. Yes, the harvest is past and we are not saved. Anyway, back to Robert. <coughs> the days of plenty are over. The high energy phase of human life is coming to a close and we have not yet learned all that we need to, to know about ourselves and the world to adapt to a new era. Does this seem overly dramatic to you? Take a look at any measure of the health of the ecosphere that makes our lives possible. The data about the intensifying negative effects of human activity on the water, soil, and climate of the planet and an unpleasant fact is unavoidable. An ongoing, large-scale human presence on the planet is impossible if we accept the assumption and give in to the demands of existing social and economic systems. Put bluntly, contemporary America's conception of, quote, the good life is inconsistent with life. And today, no serious political force is acknowledging that hard truth, let alone thinking about its implications, let alone offering meaningful policy proposals, let alone taking action. This was written during the middle of the Farrakh Obama administration, four years before Donald Trump had announced his candidacy candidacy. <clears throat> as a people, as a species, we have yet to muster the intellectual resources, political will, and moral courage needed to save ourselves and minimize the long-term damage to other living things. <clears throat> if that seems too much to bear, that's because it is. Yet, that is our challenge to face what is beyond our capacity to bear and refuse to turn away from the demands that these crises place upon us. My friend Jim Coplin was one of the few people I have ever known to meet this challenge head on. What's more, he was able to bear that truth without giving in to despair or giving up his work, always remaining part of a loving community. And again, I'm going to put the link on here. This is a long, involved piece. I'm, I'm just going to skip ahead with some of the particulars. He uh, just sums up... Um, Jim's life for several paragraphs. Uh, let's see. That's, I'm, I'm just jumping ahead um, to, uh, to Robert thinking back over Jim's life and reflecting on some of the things he learned from Jim about how to leave the planet gracefully. <clears throat> Okay. First and most basic, specific places and the whole planet both have to matter to us. For Copland, the phrase, think globally, act locally, was too simplistic. We should think and act locally and globally. Depending on the situation and the demands of the historical moment, Copland spent a lot of time studying both the human and non-human inhabitants of his place where he lived so that he could act responsibly there. As a farmer and gardener, he was especially attentive to the soil and creatures, both those that aided his soil fertility and those that stole his produce. Are you listening to this? Many of the squirrels, the squirrelies. Many of the squirrelies that ventured into his garden, or should we say peach orchard, paid a high price. 
Yes, they will, if Sancho Panza has anything to say about it. Anyway, but he understood place to be the whole place, including the trash-strewn sidewalk in front of the puppet theater where he volunteered so many hours. <laughs> Attending to our local places, <coughs> however, is only part of our obligation. Being a good steward of one's own land does not magically protect that land from the effects of global warming and rapid climate destabilization or washing away and the next flood from the next hurricane. I have to make it two years without this place washing away, wish me luck. And even if we could protect our individual places in the United States, yeah, right, Hambone, we live in an economy that is based on the destruction of places all over the world. We cannot and should not try to escape our global obligations to curb that exploitation. Second, personal habits and social systems both matter. Copland believed in personal responsibility but had no illusions that individual changes in behavior was adequate. Thank you very much. This guy understood 25 years ago that why that while it is still important, we all have a moral obligation to lower our footprint and whatnot. He he understood that if you think a few of us uh, changing our consumer and lifestyle choices in the face of this juggernaut unfolding on this planet, pull your head out of your ass. But that does not mean you should not do it. Thank you. <clears throat> Copland took the slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle, more seriously than anyone I have ever known. Like many who grew up in a world of scarcity, he was relentlessly frugal to the end of his life even when he had adequate savings and a pension to live more affluently. <clears throat> Copland believed that we reveal ourselves through our habits, and he cultivated <coughs> the habits of care and thrift, <coughs> which he saw as an expression <coughs> of respect for the world. But, he rejected the claim that one's obligations could be met just by being frugal and living simply and never suggested he was morally superior for not participating in the consumer feeding, feeding frenzy all around him. <clears throat> Copland never stopped challenging the perverse values of that culture through political activity, recognizing the problem is not how any particular individual behaves in capitalism, but capitalism's logic of endless growth and the mindless consumption that it generates. <clears throat> you know, talking about that we are all uh, part of this system. We are all cogs in this system. This is the reason that these individual changes are never going to happen. The entire system, uh, the entire system has to come down. It needs to go. Third, <clears throat> science and folk knowledge both matter. Copland valued modern science's ability to expand our understanding of the world, but he believed that this understanding is complementary to and not at odds with what ordinary people know about the world through experience. Uh, he was a voracious reader of scientific work. 
Uh, anyway, I need to, I, for time's sake, I need to jump ahead. I encourage you to read this. However, Koppen also understood the limits of science. Although he had no formal training in ecology, he had an ecologist awareness that science could never identify, let alone understand all of the complex connections and interactions in our bodies or in the world, all of which argues for considerable humility in rushing to scientific answers to all questions. Um, finally, Copland understood that like every other organism on this planet, human beings live within limits. The limits of the organism and of the systems in which an organism is embedded Contemporary society is based on a collective denial of those limits, a delusion made possible temporarily by the reigning fundamentalist faith of our day, technological fundamentalism, the belief that the increasing use of ever more sophisticated high energy, advanced technology can solve any problem, including the problems caused by the unintended consequences of such technology. <clears throat> Copland, earlier than anyone I knew, had come to understand that this technological fundamentalism, seeing computer chips and machines as our savior, was far more dangerous than even the craziest claims about saviors from the sky. But right now, I have rain falling from the sky. It's sunny and raining at the same time. Oh, well, maybe my camera's all right. Anyway, I'm going to leave the camera where, it's, where it is. <clears throat> Copland's analysis of the prospects for, for that decent human future began with the ecological realities, followed by an evaluation of the ability of our social, political, and economic systems to adapt to those ecological realities. Copland's blunt assessment. Okay. The forces set in motion by human civilization, he always puts civilization in, uh, in quotation marks, beginning with the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago and dramatically intensified in the fossil fuel epoch of the industrial revolution have degraded our planet's ecosystems in ways that cannot be reversed, that we are past the point of no return on many crucial markers. That means dramatic changes are required, not just in our lifestyles and not just in social, economic, and political systems, but in how we understand ourselves at the most basic level, how we answer the question, what does it mean to be human? I am convinced that how we define being human in a future of global instability depends very much on how honest we can be with each other and with ourselves in the present. Mainstream environmental groups, in fact, mainstream groups of any kind avoid these questions. But that does not mean people aren't struggling with those realities and assessments, typically alone or in small groups. Can you say Humpty Dumpty tribe? Copland saw no evidence that 
any society was ready to engage in the necessary discussions or consider the necessary changes, least of all the United States, states which was not an easy conclusion for him to reach because he loved the U.S. so deeply. All of his friends experienced that love with him and watched him love the living world with a reverence that led one of those friends to describe him as a nature mystic. That is why Coplin thought our task was to leave the planet gracefully because he loved us and loved the world that is our home. He loved people and the planet in a way that made him yearn for a graceful, peaceful ending, much as one wishes for a graceful and peaceful ending for a person coming to the end of an individual life. But Coplin also knew that such an elegant ending was unlikely. Yeah, you think so, Jim. Which is why he also told his closest friends I wake up every morning in a state of profound grief. I was just talking about this with Kevin Sandbloom in our interview uh, last week, how every morning I wake up and put the damn pillow over my face wishing that I could take myself out with my pillow. Anyway, again, he was not a scripture quoting fellow. But again, the words of Jeremiah echo. This is Jeremiah 8.18, quote, My grief is beyond healing. My heart is sick within me. Thank you, Jeremiah. <clears throat> Just as his comment about leaving the planet was not flippant, neither was his description of his grief. Coplin was not a demonstrative person emotionally, and many who knew him superficially might even say that he could be standoffish and aloof. But that was because he felt deeply and was aware of how easily his feelings could overwhelm him, so he was careful in public. Um... Anyway, guys, I say uh, you need to go on here and read this whole thing. I, I just have to uh, jump ahead uh, because, just for a matter, I have a whole nother sermon to uh, get to. Anyway, as difficult as these feelings were for him, Coplin knew that our only real basis for hope comes in the embrace of our grief. Not an abstract hope that somehow, magically, everything will turn out okay, but the hope that we can speak honestly with others and form these small groups and communities that can foster the radical analysis of hierarchies and illegitimate authority along with the traditional values of frugality and mutual obligation. This is what I call being a plain radical. And Coplin was the most plainly radical person I have ever known. <clears throat> Uh, I don't want to romanticize my friend, blah, 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 but in my experience, it is rare to find one person who follows both lines of thought so deeply and lives with the ideas with such forbearance and equanimity. He romanticized neither revolutionary politics nor rural life but rather drew the best from each tradition and constructed a political and ecological life that made sense for him. <clears throat> uh, by never exempting himself from the obligation to critically self-reflect, 
he made it hard for us to wiggle out of it. When I speak of these struggles, people invariably call me a downer and too negative. I used to believe that was true, that I was being depressing by pushing these issues, but I have come to see that claims, that that claim inverts reality. In fact, I am the positive one <clears throat> by placing my faith in our collective ability to bear the truth that is beyond bearing, I am affirming the best aspects of our humanity, just like my friend Jim Copland. Those who demand that we ignore the painful questions are, in fact, the downers, the people stuck in negativity, the ones who have no faith in themselves or others to face reality honestly. Without that commitment to facing reality honestly, the harvest will have passed. The summer will have ended forever and we will not be able to save ourselves. Thank you very much. And that is the, will bring us to the end of Doomsday Sermon number one for Sunday, February 25th, 2018. And I'm going to come back to you with a genuine sermon. This is an, uh, called Hope is for the Lazy, the Challenge of Our Dead World. A genuine sermon that uh, Brother uh, Robert gave in Austin, Texas in 2012. Coming back in one minute. Are you shivering over there? Is it that cold? You say, Pop, you got a long sleeve t shirt and a goose down vest on. It's actually getting to be a fine day. I gotta get out here and start fighting this Bermuda grass in my garden. Bye guys.